Welcome everyone. We're so glad that you joined us today for this presentation from Emily out of our um, Student Diversity and Initiatives Department here at Missouri S&T. We are excited to be learning with her today and so glad that you took the time on your lunch to join us. Joining me today from our global learning team, I have um, Clarissa Meyer who's helping me monitor the chat. Should you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to just put them in the chat and we can view them and um, help Emily kind of manage through those so she can focus on her presentation. Emily uh, is joining us, like I said, from the Office of Student Diversity Initiative out of Missouri S&T, the Equity and Inclusion Educator for this department. She also advises the National Society of Black Engineers and Spectrum Chapters at Missouri University of Science and Technology. So without further delay, I will turn the screen over to Emily and let her get started. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, today, I have been asked to share with all of you uh, my presentation on diversity in the classroom, which focuses and it was created with teachers in mind to create an inclusive environment. However, you can use everything that you learn here today and apply it to your everyday life and just move along. Use it in, you know, at home, use it whenever you go to any meetings at work. So hopefully you can learn a lot today. Um, like, uh, Sylvia said, my name is Emily and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And, and I am going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be defining bias and implicit bias. We're going to reflect on those a little bit on a more personal level and then see how they can impact the decisions that we make every day, as well as understand the, what the role that our biases play on the life of other people and those that surround us. And we're going to end with examining ways in which we can create an inclusive environment for all. So to start, here's the definition of bias that I'm going to be using today. When we talk about bias, we talk about an inclination, preference, or automatic emotional response to something that we see, hear, or experience. So let's use this as an example. I'm sure a lot of you have encountered a toy that looks like this. You either have it when you were younger, if you are a teacher, or maybe you have kids, grandchildren, you may have been seeing this toy recently as well. So I'm sure that a lot of us can just grab this and immediately, automatically, without even thinking about it, just go in and put all the pieces where they're supposed to go, right? Well, that is something that our bias helps us do. It helps us kind of create some maps in our head so that we don't have to overthink whenever we do things. It's kind of automatic. You saw this and now you know that, you know where you're supposed to fit every single piece, right? Even if you haven't used this specific toy that I have pictured here, you know where it goes, right? Well, let me share something with you. This is a square. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what it did. There we go. This is a square. Well, my video is not showing. I'm not sure why. I just tested it a second ago. But Pretty much what this video does is it grabs a person has this specific toy that we see right here and this person just starts going piece by piece and grabs the the little rectangle that we see there the little yellow piece and then puts it in the square spot because that's where it fits then it grabs the little cube at the top right puts it in the square spot because that's where it fits and then they grab the little green piece that's right next to the triangle that's a little bit of a skinnier rectangle and they say okay where do you where do you think this one fits and then immediately goes and places it in the little square spot because that's where the piece fits 
And they do the same with every other piece. Every single piece that you're seeing here on the right actually fits into the spot that's shaped like a square. So think about that for a second. Automatically, what we want to do is put the pieces where we think they should be. However, how many of us would actually take the time to see every single one of these shapes and put them in the spot where we think they should fit? Or are we going to test every single spot to see where it can actually fit? We wouldn't be surprised and notice that more than one of these pieces fit in more than one spot. So yes, we have our automatic responses like our biases make us have, and those lead us to immediately think that we know where everything is supposed to go and everywhere everything is supposed to fit. But that's not always the case. So I'm going to give you another example. This is a square. Imagine that you're just nicely walking around your house and suddenly you encounter this nice tenant in the corner of your house or your apartment or your working space, or wherever it is that you are. What do you do? Do you scream? Do you call out for someone to help you squash the spider? Do you find the closest roll of newspaper that you can use to hit it? Do you um, maybe find a, a cup that you can use it to trap it and maybe free it later? What do you do in this situation? Most of us would probably freak out a little because, you know, spiders, we have learned that spiders are maybe not the friendliest. But what if I were to tell you that this specific spider that I'm picturing here is actually a nice spider. It can't hurt you because it has very little, 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 super tiny fangs that won't even break your skin. And even if they did, the toxin that it produces, it's harmless to humans. I'm telling you this, right? Would you allow me to put that spider on your arm and let it crawl off? Would you, allow, would, you, would you get closer to it? Would you think twice before reaching for that rolled up piece of newspaper before you squashed it? Maybe, maybe not. But here's the thing, we have learned that spiders could potentially hurt us, not all of them, but some of them, right? So our bias is telling us danger and it's there to protect us, is there to tell us that this eight legged thing that we're seeing in our house, in our space is there to hurt us. However, I want you to really think about that. Are you thinking about this from the perspective of it being a safety thing or are you thinking about it in more of like a prejudice kind of way. I told you the spider will do nothing to you and it cannot hurt you. Does that change the way that you look at the spider or does it not? Our biases can do several things. One of them, yes, it can save, it can keep us in a safe environment. It can keep us alert and it can let us know whenever we are unsafe. So if we had to closely inspect every single spider before we decided if it was a safe spider or not, we would probably get bitten a lot. However, we know that not every single spider out there is out there to get us. So prejudice is something that we also need to be aware of. And that comes from your implicit biases. And an implicit bias just refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, our actions, our decisions, but they do it in an unconscious manner. Now you may think that you know and that you're aware of all of your biases and all the inclinations that you have and all the responses that you have to everything around you. But here's the thing, if they are implicit biases, they really are implicit. They are in the back of your mind. 
you do not think about them. They just sit there and they make you react and do things without you even realizing it. So your implicit bias may have told you spider equals danger, but maybe your rational brain can come up and say, hey, maybe this one is not a dangerous spider. And that's the good thing that we can all work towards. Not all biases are bad. Not all implicit biases can be overridden, but we can be more aware of the actions that we take every day and take a step back and think about, did I do this because I had some sort of prejudice or something that forced me to do this in an automatic way? So here's a really short activity and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do this. Look at the pictures that I have here on the screen. These are just normal people that you may encounter in everyday life. Now I want you to take a look at this list of uh, jobs. And I want you to mentally assign a job from this list to each person in, this, in these pictures. Now we cannot repeat jobs. So each job goes to one person only. As you're doing that, when you think about it is, it, is it easy to do? Is it difficult to do? If it's easy, is it because you're allowing your biases to tell you, you know, this person looks like a secretary, so I'm going to give you the secretary role. If it's difficult, is it difficult because you're thinking, well, I don't know any of these people. There's no way I can assign them a job. I don't know what they do. Or is it difficult because you're actively fighting against your biases? And you're telling yourself, okay, this person may look like a doctor, but maybe I shouldn't give them the doctor role because, because they're making me do this and I don't want anyone to think that I'm assigning the doctor role to this person just because I think they may look like a doctor. So we don't do these things on an everyday basis if we're considering that I'm just asking you to give a job to someone. However, every day when we walk around campus, around school, in a store, every single person that we see around us, we automatically start making assumptions about these people. We may not assign them a job, but we start thinking about other things and we kind of make a quiet profile in the back of our heads. And again, this is all quickly, it's done implicitly. We don't have to think about those things. Our brain is thinking about how many eggs I need for the recipe that I found on Pinterest today. So thinking about that, let's think about, let's talk about inclusion. And let's talk about the difference between fitting in and belonging. So when we think about fitting in, we think about having to change ourselves to be able to feel like nobody around us is going to think that we're standing out, that we're not bothering anyone. And on the other side, when someone feels like they belong somewhere, they don't feel like they have to change themselves. They don't feel like they're supposed to take an extra step. So think where in these two scenarios do you think there are more prevalent biases and prejudices against others? Is it the space where you feel that you have to work hard to fit in? Or is it the space where you feel safe and open about yourself because you know everyone is going to accept you regardless? To give a more straightforward definition of inclusion, we can talk about inclus inclusion or a place being inclusive whenever it's shaped to meet everyone's needs. Whenever there's full and equal participation of all groups. 
whenever everything is equitable, not just equal, but equitable. And when every single member of the group, the team, whoever's in the class, whoever's in your meeting, in your place of work, they all feel physically and psychologically safe and secure. Now, you may be thinking, I, I do all these things. I strive to meet everyone's needs. I strive to make sure everyone's participating and that everything is equitable. Um, but let me share something with you. And this is where I'm going to focus more on the younger population. Here are some statistics for members of the LGBTQ plus community, which within their own school that they go to, they have been threatened or injured with a weapon. Do you think that they feel psychologically and physically safe and secure? Here's another statistic for the same LGBTQ plus community. They have been bullied at school. Do you feel like they have equal participation? Do you feel like they, do you think that they feel safe and secure where they are? When we look at people of color, black students are suspended and expelled three times more than white students. And they also represent a smaller percentage of the student population but a higher percentage of those who are referred to law enforcement or even suggest, subjected to school-related arrest. Do you think that they feel safe in their space? Do you think that the treatment is being, it's equitable? Thinking about students with disabilities, they face so many barriers because they don't have the access to the tools that they need to be successful. And if you, Combine that with other identities like being African American, you even get more barriers to being successful. I want you to take a look at this little chart here. It is organized by race and ethnicity, and it talks about the percent of students, what this was done in 2007, the study, but students that felt like they had been discriminated against when applying to college or while they were in college because of their race or ethnicity. You may be thinking, well, you know, we do all these things in place. We make sure that they're not being discriminated and we make sure that we're, we're, we're putting our best work out there to support all of these students. But this is what the students feel. This is what they see. This is what everyone around you feels and sees. So who's getting the short end of the stick here most of the time? It is our marginalized populations. It, it is those that feel like there's an unequal power relationship between them and the society that they're in. So what can we do about this? I want to give you tools so that you can be someone who can provide openness and safety to students, to employees, to everyone around you. You may be familiar with the term microaggressions, which I don't like that term because they're not micro, they're, they're hurtful. Microaggressions are just statements or actions or you know things that we regard as just like little subtle indirect um, attacks. That's what they are. And they, they are hurtful, but I don't want to dwell on this because we all have probably heard this and we know that microaggressions are not a good thing. And so I want to introduce to you the term microinclusions. So instead of focusing on making sure that we never make mistakes when we're speaking, we can focus on doing little things to support those around us. Microinclusions are small actions that force us to recall the humanity of others. So if your bias is telling you that the spider is going to kill you, maybe you should take a step back 
Think about if that's your implicit bias telling you that. Maybe instead of squishing it, getting a cup and putting it outside. A good example of a micro inclusion, think if you've ever done a team building activity and what you think about is like, oh, you know, everyone loves ropes courses. So let's do that. Let's do a ropes course. And then when you're intending, you're planning and you're all excited about this and you're thinking your team's going to love you, your class is going to love you. And then you remember that there's someone in your class, somebody in your team who recently broke their ankle and they're wearing a cast around their leg. And you remember that you also have a team member or a student who's terrified of heights. What do you do? Do you continue with your ropes course activity or do you practice a micro inclusion and try to remember about those two individuals who need your support and you find a more inclusive activity? So what else can you do to promote a safe and inclusive environment for everyone around you? First things first, embracing diversity. Stop thinking about diversity, about something that's just kind of like an extra layer that some people that are not you have. That's not what diversity is. Diversity is about differences. So embrace that. Embrace that everyone brings differences to the table. Increase your awareness. Educate yourself. Try to stay up to date on, new, on the news and keep your eyes and ears open. If you hear something or if you see something, make sure that you address it. Explore your biases, examine your assumptions, examine your curriculums, your policies, and strive to be fair in everything that you do. Make sure that you're being equitable. Encourage collaboration. Find other educators, other teachers around you. Find directors across departments. Find people who are on your same level that you can collaborate with so that you can bring more to the table. Help build friendships, connect people. We all need that. Just make sure that if you're ever starting to connect people or asking them to collaborate, that you establish some set of ground rules so that communication can be open, free, and safe. Be adaptable. Learning people's names is a great thing to do. Nobody wants to be called by you, the one with the red hat. Nobody likes that. We all like to be called by our names. Modeling inclusive language, using multiple and diverse examples, including those in materials that you're handing out, using diverse names, diverse images, and then being mindful of those low Q abilities. We saw in those statistics that people with disabilities face pretty big, um, barriers in their learning journey. And then make sure that you are a safe space for everyone. Provide safety. Don't ask people to speak for a group that they represent. You can educate yourself at your own time. We have the internet at our fingertips now. And then make sure that you practice micro-inclusions. So moving forward, if you would like to learn more about um, how to support marginalized communities, Two opportunities that I have coming up is I'm working with the Department of Global Learning to record a training on pronouns and LGBTQ plus basics. And if you have any other questions after today, you can also feel free to contact the Department of Student Diversity Initiatives. Thank you everyone for your time. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Emily, that was great. Thank you so much for sharing those tips. And like she said, we are working with um, Emily and the Student Diversity Initiatives Department on getting some um, asynchronous courses available. So student, so our community and um, those that are both on a, on a campus or in a workplace environment can learn more so that you can be more aware of how to um, do your micro inclusions. One of the questions, Emily, that I that I have for you is, um, what are some suggestions to help us kind of be aware of our own bias? I know that it's sometimes difficult to know what we have or, or where some of our own biases come from. Do you have suggestions on how to be aware of that? Definitely. Um, one of the easiest ways to do that is to try to be more aware of your responses to certain 
um, instances or things that are happening around you. If your first response to when you notice somebody is walking towards you is that you're clutching your purse closer to you, start thinking about why you did that. Um, that's the easiest way to start uncovering our unconscious biases is to be aware of everything that we do and start to find the why behind why we did something. That's great advice, thank you. Um, I was just looking at the chat and we had a question, somebody asking if we would consider offering a future session on institutional hazing. And that's definitely something that we can evaluate and um, find the right presenter that can do that. Um, Emily, I hope you get a chance to read some of this chat. They are very much praising you for your presentation and are very thankful for it um, with great information for anyone. So I had, um, Another question is you, I really appreciated um, that you added some tips at the end of your presentation. And it, it kind of helped me think about um, how to help people feel safe and secure. And I guess you kind of answered that as well, uh, but just was looking, you know, is there different tips or if we don't have the opportunity to educate ourselves on certain things, are there, are there some small steps that we can take in a environment like that? I would say that the first state step is always that first one that I put there, which is embracing diversity and kind of letting it come in. Putting ourselves in contact with people who have different backgrounds, different ideas, think of things differently. It's a great first step to start learning about different things. So surrounding ourselves with different types of people come from different cultures and different backgrounds, it's the best way to start learning without having to, as ourselves, go out there and start looking for that information if we don't even know what information we're looking for at that time. Perfect, yes. I think sometimes we all find ourselves gravitating to those that think like us and act like us. And we sometimes forget that the best, the best teacher is um, getting to know other people, so. And there was another comment, we'll, we'll definitely look into that as well, um, maybe doing presentations on workplace bullies or workplace harassment. Those are great topics that we can look to find some uh, speakers to help us um, present those. Again, lots of comments about you were, were easy to follow examples and a great speaker, um, but I, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So we will just um, say thank you, Emily. We really appreciate the time that you took to put this together for us and to share it to our global learning audience. I think that there were a lot of key takeaways and um, I posted earlier in the chat, but the recording of this presentation as well as her slides will be shared on our website. So feel free to rewatch it or share it with those in your workplace or in the classroom where you think this might be beneficial and um, look for us to start sharing out information when the further um, education comes on board for the pronouns and um, the basics course. So thank you all very much for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful afternoon.